So in 2005, my, my first wife and I had a tragedy. We, we really struggled to have children. We, have, we had 10 miscarriages and, and we finally um, had, had a child go full term and lived seven days and passed away. Her, her name was Macy Ann Marie. And, uh, and so as you can imagine, it's, it's the worst thing that's ever happened in my life, gut wrenching. So it took about a year to get out of that fog and to try and understand. And, and, you know, it's just, it's gut wrenching and, and, and I'm sorry for having to bring the call, whole call down, but it changed my life. And the reason it did is I was driving. I just took off. We, we jumped in the truck, which, by the way, I used F-150 and we started driving to Colorado and we got to, to Estes Park, Colorado, and I was flipping through the stations. And you can imagine you're cried out, man. You are emotionally exhausted. You, you're, you're begging God to take you instead of your child. Like it's, it's as bad as it gets for, for a father. And I, I overhear this psychologist sharing the third, a third, a third principle. And it goes like this. Here's the challenge. This is where keeping up with the Joneses comes from. We spend most of our time and effort. I spent the first half of my life trying to impress people who were, I was never going to be good enough to be around. So I went out, I had to buy the nice things. I had to show off the nice cars and I had to overspend to try and impress people who absolutely wanted to see me fail and, and loved it when they saw me almost go bankrupt. Right. So during this, this year, I had this kind of spiritual awakening and that was, I'm not going to spend one more ounce of my life with that group of people. In fact, I'm going to do everything I can to get out of relationship with that group. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour all my time. And if, you, if you're listening to this, you can't see it. Sorry about that. I'm going to get out of relationship with the third that's never going to love me no matter what. And I don't care what you think about me. When you go through something like that, that powerful, it's liberating. It, you know, if there's any silver lining, I made, I made the decision that day. No one's ever going to treat me poorly and I'm not going to treat anybody poorly. All right, guys, here we go now. It is time to unlock more doors to deals. We're real estate investors here. We're real estate agents here. And we all have one thing in common. We believe that we can. We can live the life of our purpose. We can create financial freedom. We can build a better life for those that we love. And we can live the life of our dreams. I don't care if you're trying to do your first deal or your 500th this year. You can get to the next level. And we're here to help. Welcome to Doors to Deals. I'm your host and founder, Jim Manning. Today's episode can be found on doorstodeals.com slash 084. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have the president of Keller Williams on the line. His name's Mark King. And by president, no, I don't mean like a bank president where uh, you're a president and you, there's 15 of you in the same division. Uh, what I mean when I say president of Keller Williams, what that means is if you Google Keller Williams and you click on the little drop box, you'll see Gary Keller's name and then you'll see Mark King's name right beneath him. So we, he's a, a top achiever, a uh, top one percenter. And anytime I can get someone that has uh, reached such a high level of success. I get really excited on the podcast because because I take a lot of notes and I, and I just know you're going to as well because uh, Mark really brought the value today. And uh, I'm also fortunate enough to call Mark a personal friend and mentor. We've known each other for a number of years and uh, he has blessed my life and he has made me a better person and a better business leader. And uh, for that, Mark, if you're listening to this, I really appreciate you, man. So before we get started, uh, let's get into some resources that we have available uh, for you agents out there. Uh, we're all about financial freedom and trying to unlock wealth, not only for yourself and for your clients. Uh, we're an open book here. If you have any questions, need any help when it comes to investing in real estate, reach out to us, let us know. Uh, deals at three doors.com, which is a good email address for us if you have any questions, anything like that. And then we also have a lot of funds available. We have the cash to put together deals. Uh, it's actually over $20 million that we invest here in St. Louis. Uh, if you need any cash to put together a deal, uh, reach out to us and um, let's see if we can put together a deal. Uh, then finally, the last thing before we get started on the interview, uh, let's go into the iTunes review of the week. This review comes to us from KCT titled, Awesome, five stars. Casey writes, been a part of the community for a year and it has already changed my outlook on investing. I love all the information in this podcast and can't wait to hear more. 
Casey, thank you for your review. Jim, back to you. All right. Thanks for that review. Hey, if you're getting value out of this podcast, show us some love. Leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you, and we really appreciate it. So, all right, that's it. No more talk. Let's get into this interview. All right, guys, Jim Manning, and we got Caleb and Ryan here. And today we have none other than Mark King, uh, the president of all of Keller Williams. He's uh, Gary Keller's right-hand man. So we are excited. We're pumped up to have him. Uh, before we get started, just a quick public service announcement. Um, we help uh, people become financially free here at Three Doors. Our goal is to help 250 people over the next 10 years achieve that financial freedom. And last year, uh, we generated $130,000 a month in passive income. So if you have any sort of interest in learning more about what we have going on, all you have to do is just send over an email to deals at three doors.com. That's D E A L S at three doors.com. And we can connect and, and get you more information on that. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Mark King. So Mark, um, can you tell everybody a, a, a little bit of, of your background about yourself? And, and for those of us that, uh, that don't know you and have never heard of Mark King. Yeah. Hopefully that's a lot of people. Uh, so thank you for having me. Number one, number two, uh, I just have to say, this makes me smile to get to hang out with you guys. Uh, we were talking before this started about, we, we used to, to hang out and whiteboard and, and dream and do all those things. And that's probably, I think eight years ago, Jim, that I, uh, ran into you in a salad line, if you remember, and, and I forget where we were. And then that led to uh, what I think is a great relationship. We've had a lot of uh, bouncing ideas off of each other. You guys have helped so many of, of our agents and our people in our wealth community build passive income. I always tease you guys because you give all the best deals to, to people other than me. However, I'll get over it for today. Uh, but I'm, I'm just super thankful to be here. I started out as a real estate agent in 2001. I got my license. But before that, I was an investor. And like most males in our mid-20s, we knew everything. And so I accumulated $6 million of debt in, in real estate because I didn't listen to people like Ryan and Jim. So I clawed out of that by 2013. This is a 12-year journey to, to get out of that horrible, the horrible decisions I made. And I started investing in real estate again. And I started learning. And this time I kind of got it right. So I have a $6 million education from the University of Hard Knocks in investing in real estate. And so I'm so I have a very, I have very um, clear and decisive views on how I like to invest, but I don't always tell other people how they should. Short version of my background, I've been in every role in this company over the last 20 years. I was a, I was a top agent uh, in, in, in this company. I have run 15 different market centers or franchises. I've run regions. Uh, I was the divisional leader, then director of growth, and now president, and uh, get to work with Gary Keller every day, as you said. So that's the short version. I failed at every one of those, by the way, just like my investing story. Uh, I was a terrible agent until I figured it out, et cetera. So that's, hopefully I can add some some value to any, any of you out there going, man, this is a lot. It sounds like it's too complicated or too risky or whatever the case is. So for those who haven't had the opportunity to spend time as we have, I don't want to everyone to think that he failed. Clearly, he's not the president because he failed. He failed forward, which is something that he likes to talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. And he's learned. He questions everything. He always fails forward. I want to make sure everyone knows that because you are you like to discredit yourself. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of wealth and knowledge from this man that we're talking to because mm -hmm. of all those experiences. And he's had a lot of success every 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 opportunity he's had. Otherwise, he wouldn't be where he's at. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I'm actually 29, but I look 48. So that's this is what happens when you... You look great for 29. Hey, the first, the first question I have that I think I've been dying to ask. So Gary Keller, what is it like to talk to him, be next to him, work with him every day? How much have you it learned is, from him? It's a thrill. I, here's how I'd describe Gary. In fact, you know, and I'm, I'm with him every day. I might be sitting on a couch. It may be a, a loving coaching moment. Um, I may be in a boardroom, wherever the case is. Gary's the same person everywhere. And I've learned so much and I've worked with him offsite for years, but getting to be on the ground in person has, has been, has been amazing. Here's what I would say. Uh, imagine working with Steve Jobs. If Steve Jobs was super generous and caring and in the, in the same level of visionary, right? That's kind of how Gary thinks. Gary is by his very nature is a very direct human. And for me, I like that. I'm a very direct human. I want to get to the bottom and get to the solution. 
Um, and sometimes I think people can, can take both of us at being too direct when we don't realize we're being too direct, if that makes sense. So the cool thing about Gary and I, and I'm going to say Jason Abrams and Jay Papazan and Carl Liebert is we communicate at a very high level because we're, we're, we're quick and direct, but very loving. And Gary is, is yesterday, uh, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with a little bit of a crisis in California today, which is fun. And, and yesterday, Gary came up and, and, and put his arm around me and said, you're going to be awesome. You're the perfect person to handle this. And right. He's that kind of leader as well. So super inspiring. I think the man is, is a genius. But here, here's, here's a secret. I'm going to tell you a secret. Here's the secret of Gary Keller. This is breaking news. There's no one who talks to top real estate agents and top real estate business owners on a daily basis more than Gary Keller. He will have four or five conversations, coaching sessions, whatever the case is, today with people who operate at the very highest level in this industry. So what he does is he hears what's going on with all the top agents, and then he kind of you know, regurgitates that back to other agents to see if they're experiencing the same thing. And because of that experience, no one is more in tune with what's happening in real estate than Gary Keller. He's also extremely smart. He also sees what's coming. He studies the market. He does all those things. But it's really his on the ground conversations every day with business leaders that informs him, and he just takes action. And what happens is five years later, the industry follows and says, oh my gosh, Gary was a visionary five years ago. It's a long answer to your short question, sorry. That was, that was a fantastic answer. So one of the things you mentioned there is, is Gary and you, for that matter, talk about the market, look at the market, research the market. Everyone's intrigued by the market right now. So share a little bit of thoughts on the market, if you will. Man, I get all my market news from YouTube because there's a bunch of, just kidding. Uh, but here's the thing. There's, a, there's gurus everywhere and I would never purport to be one because here's who I trust. I trust people who want to teach me something and who openly admit we have no idea what's actually going to happen in the market. If we have, if those are the first two foundational comments, I can hang out with you because the truth is nobody knows. And there's a lot of scare tactics here, et cetera. I'm going to give you the best to my, the best of my ability, the things I'm seeing and where trends should go if this is normal. But if we'd have been having this conversation, go back to 2006, 2007, and look at all of the gurus back then who questioned there would be a recession at all. Now, I, I don't believe we're going to go back there. You've got several factors that are that are propping up the market right now that I think uh, we don't have a short solution for. One is inventory, listing inventory, home inventory. We have the largest uh, population in our history looking for houses right now. And 52% of, of that group, that generation is living back at home when they come back from college. The pent up demand for starter homes weighed against the cost of lumber, for example. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's any new construction going on in St. Louis that you could buy for 250, 300. There's certainly nothing in Austin you can buy for less than 800 that's new construction. So when you look at the current interest rates that are on the rise, you're talking about a $3,000 monthly payment for a starter home. Now add that, that to the labor market, which is interesting, right? People are getting big raises and that sort of thing, but that's still a huge amount of your monthly payment. And most new home buyers buy on a monthly payment, much to our chagrin. So what happens is they, they just can't afford what, what builders can afford to build and make a profit on. So until you fix that supply and demand econ 101 issue, there's no huge burden on the horizon. The challenge there is one government policy could change that overnight. One government aid that says, we're gonna, we're gonna subsidize the cost of building materials, for example. I don't know that anybody's gonna do this, but we go back to, I, I, I learned from history. And if you remember back in 2004, we started to see some serious cracks in, in the housing market. And I started telling people, let's, let's save cash, save your cash, save your cash. By 2006, when it didn't change, I went all in. That's how you get $6 million in debt. And so I bought most of my properties in late 2006, early 2007. And I went nuts. Look how smart I am. Like, Aren't you glad I'm on this podcast? Because that's how smart I was last time. So here I am again, telling everybody, hoard your cash. But I don't see a path. And it's market dependent. I, there's certainly not a path in Austin, Texas, where the population has doubled in the last three years. And prop tech companies are coming here left and right, et cetera. There's not a path for the market to fall 25%. There's just not that path like it did in 2008, 2009. In St. Louis, it may be different. In your neighborhood in St. Louis, it may be different, 
right? But as long as the replacement cost, and I'll tell you, one of the tips that I use, I, I created a relationship with an insurance agent early in my career. And then I actually bought a, an insurance business with them and they ran it. And the reason I did that is I started taking this guy out to coffee and I wanted to learn what replacement values were doing in any given market in any given moment. And I learned a lot about the insurance business, but when you have that connection, that relationship, that information, it will inform you of where prices are likely to head. Doesn't always happen that way. But insurance companies have professionals every day studying their actuary tables and their risk tolerance and their different things. So just one of the little tips I would give you is have a great relationship with a, with a confidant in the insurance business. So all that saying, I, I, there's no possible way that the market continues to appreciate by the same percentage, meaning 17% last year, right? Just go to any compound interest calculator and put 17% in year over year over any span of time, and it gets crazy. We, if we did that over a 20-year period, the average sales price would be $10 million. We know that's not going to happen. So at some point, we've got to level out. Well, what are the things that impact that? Rising interest rates are going to impact that. Affordability is already at an all-time low. So we can't move interest rates up any higher right now without seriously damaging what's already a stressed inventory level. So I'll just pause on that because I'm throwing out a lot of jargon at you. But the point is, there's nothing on the roadmap right now that says, alert, alert, alert. The only thing I'm going to tell you from my personal experience is, I'm going, I'll, I'll do it this way. I'm heavy, heavy, heavy in cash right now. And you go, well, that's dumb. You lost 7% on your money, right? That's for every million dollars of cash you've got. I know that sounds like a crazy number, but $70,000 you lost. That's how I get it to make, make my, my stomach hurt. You lost $70,000 because inflation was 7% and you had the money on the sidelines, right? But to me, that, that would be a $70,000 insurance policy against losing $300,000 in that moment. So I'm heavy into cash. I am making sure my leverage positions on any real estate I own, if I have leverage against it, and luckily I've been able to pay that off. But if I have leverage against real estate, I'm getting myself into such a desirable position, and that's probably 50% at least. So if I have extra cash, I'm throwing it against any leverage debt I have on, on income producing properties. The only thing I wouldn't sell that has a loan on it right now is investment real estate. Everything else, if I have a truck payment, I'm getting rid of the truck. Like I, I don't want to scare people because I have no idea. I, there's nothing on the horizon that this year looks any different than last year. But if, if we're smart, here's what I've always lived by this rule since I've had kind of my awakening. And that is if everybody's running in one direction, everybody's on Bitcoin right now, walk the other way. I'm not buying Bitcoin, right? I, I didn't buy it when it was 2000 a coin. I'm, I didn't buy it at 80,000. I'm not buying Bitcoin. I don't know enough about it. And I can't, that, to me, that's just gambling. and I can't control it. You can control cash flow. You can control market rates. You control a lot of those things. So let me, I'll just, I'll, I'll pause there. Was that a long, long answer? No, I oh, think it was, oh. it was, sorry, go ahead. I, I think it was, it was interesting because you, you just made me think of something here. You're talking about, because we get so much into like limbing mindset of running in the same direction as everybody else. And I was sitting here thinking about that. As you said, that. I was like, man, like, I, I think I need to check myself and some of the things I'm doing not to have a limbing mindset. Um, well, and especially, this is going to sound like your older brother, especially at your age. And I mean that lovingly, because if you, if I could go back to, I don't know how old you are, but if I could go back to my mid twenties and if I had Jim or Ryan as a mentor at their age today, not back then, because they'd have been in their teens. But if I would have had, if I would have had someone mentoring me who was able to get through to me, right. Cause that was the least coachable I've ever been in my life. I don't know about anybody else who's, who's gone through their twenties. Uh, but if I'd have had someone mentoring me, I'd be worth hundreds of millions of dollars today because I didn't, I'm not. And so that it, one of the things that people will listen to, they'll listen to this podcast and they'll say, oh my gosh, I want, I, I too want to go buy really cheap real estate. I want to rent it for really high. I want to cash flow at a big deal. I want to BRRRRRRRRR this method. And I'm going to go make tens of millions of dollars which is awesome. And you should, and there is a way to do that. And we have proof that that works. And, and these are the best people I know in this entire country at, at, at doing this. The problem is if you skip a step, if you're undereducated, if you don't listen, if you're not coachable, et cetera, one wrong move, I can tell you the story about the $2.2 million building that I built that I sold for 1.3, 13 months later and had to pay the rest off. And I can tell you about the seven plex I bought for, it was a steal at 105,000 only to have a, a shooting 
and a lawsuit and a $30,000 dump price for, I can tell you all the fun stories, but one bad deal while you're getting going can sideline you for life. You have, you have to have a mentor. So I'm so real. I'm so glad you said that we, our goals aligned and that we're helping people become financially free. Jim mentioned the 250 people at the intro. I know you're really into that on your seven yep. wealth building. If anybody wants to join, I'm sure you'd be happy to have them. Um, seven 30 on Fridays. Yep. And the reason I, I want to elaborate on that a little bit more is there's times we have meetings every single week. We now have a team of somewhere in the thirties or maybe a little bit higher. And I can just see some of the people in our meetings and, and Caleb is a little bit younger than we are. He's recruited a lot of 20 somethings. And I see some of these, these people every single week, we're telling them they can be financially free every single week. We're talking about how to do deals. And every single week I'm, I'm met with a face like this. Yeah. And I, and I, and it's just like, everyone can do it. Everyone. Yeah. Everyone can do it. And one of the secrets, one of the things I've learned on my wealth building journey of teaching others that, that Ryan, I think you've seen as well is we tend to live off our cash flow. So if I could give you one rule of thumb, if, if, if you left, let's just say you, you went to college and, and for those of us who went to college and lived off ramen noodles and had no money, we'll remember those days fondly. If you could live without changing your lifestyle dramatically while you build your investment portfolio, you'll get financially free quickly. The reason so many people struggle to get financially free is their in their their expenses creep as they make investments. So now you're forced to start living on leverage money. That 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 is a recipe for disaster. If you're dependent on the cash flow, you're in trouble. So I my monthly budget. A lot of people don't know this, Ryan. My monthly budget until I was in my mid thirties was five thousand dollars a month at at its max. Right now you think about what you can live on in five thousand dollars a month today. And there was a lot of things I went without. There's a lot of cars I didn't buy. There's a lot of houses I didn't own. There was a lot, right? But my personal financial budget was 5,000. And what authored that is that happened to be the lowest amount of passive income that I was making from any of my real estate investments once I got fit and I wasn't gonna go above it. So if, if I could give anybody one bit of advice as you're building your passive income and becoming debt-free or, or financially free, the expense side is just as important, especially in the beginning as the income side. You know, that, that's that's, that's, that's the most point. valuable thing he's dropped this whole time. Do not increase your expenses, guys. Yeah. Sorry, well, 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 what happens? We meet we meet the the love of our life. We we start a family. We got to get a dog. You got to go to Petland. You got to get the eight hundred dollar dog. But it's not eight hundred dollars because now you got to feed it, and then you have a vet bill. And then what we do is we got to get a nicer car because I can't be driving around my love of my life in this car. And so before you know it, your monthly budget's so high that you're forced to either take a job you don't want, you're forced to make some bad decisions financially, and if I could just if I if I could take my nephews um, by the collar because one's thirty and he's aw- he's he's awesome and he's done all the right things. I made him study Dave Ramsey when he was a teenager. He loved that as, as his uncle. But I have a I have another one who's a little more free and wild and and that sort of thing. If I could take him by the collar, I would just say because right now his he lives at home, right? He's one of those fifty two percent. He has a, he has a great job at Amazon and he is making more money than it costs him to live. If I could convince him of anything, it would be stay there, stockpile cash. Let me help you start investing in real estate. Yeah. And I I think the thing that's helped me guys on it is like understanding compounding interest and like a cup of coffee isn't just $5 or whatever the heck it is now. I'm not a coffee drinker. A luxury car, if you spend $60,000 on a luxury car, well, over 30 years, you know, that's about $490,000 that 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 car really cost you. Had you taken that same money and invested into something that gave you a return? This is how we ruin everybody's Fridays. We'll, we'll <laughs> talk about we'll talk about this subject, but I want you to think about the, the story. I love is my my stepson when he was sixteen wanted a thousand dollar laptop for 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 the holidays, and I sat down with him and I said, "Well, what if instead I gave you a thousand dollars and you put it in an index fund, and this is what it would be at seventy one? And someone will have to help me with the math at twelve percent times, you know, sixteen years old to seventy one. But it was in the several, several millions of dollars. If so that he had a multi-million dollar laptop that he was wanting. Now, long story short, you know how this ends. We got him a laptop and he loves it and all those things. But the point is I look at everything I buy as costing me double. Why? Because I'm in a high tax bracket and I have to give the government half my money before I get to buy the thing. So if I look at a shirt, that's a hundred dollars, it actually costs me 200 is how my brain 
thinks about it. So everything you purchase, consumerism is the number one killer of wealth building. A thousand dollars. A thousand dollars from twelve to seventy-one is eight hundred and one thousand dollars. At twelve percent, with or... at twelve percent, with zero oh. additional money put into it, just less, having a thousand. Less than I thought. You had to put in like a hundred dollars a month and then see what that turns into. It's probably the route we went down. But the point is, it's an eight hundred thousand dollar laptop. When you think about it that way, I remember Ryan. I can't remember. I think it was your father-in-law that I met. Yep, and he's done well financially, very, very well financially. And if you've ever read Dr. Thomas Stanley, Stop Acting Rich, I think Stanley wrote that book on your, on your father-in-law because he had zero bling on. He looked like every normal person I'd ever met in my life. And I don't know how many gazillions he's worth and all the, all the, all the things he's done. He's a super smart guy. But that's ironically, that's the average millionaire in this country. It's not Kim Kardashian. And that's, that's the challenge. None of us are, are likely to ever reach the heights of LeBron James, but we see him drive a Bentley and we want a Bentley. The reality is most millionaires in this country drive a used uh, Lexus. That's been paid off for 15, 20, 30 years. Yeah, they paid happened. cash for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. right. No, it, it, undoubtedly. I mean, I can't tell you, I'll, I'll give you one example. So I know um, have been fortunate enough to meet a lot of wealthy people in my life. Uh, One is a local banker. And uh, this banker shows up. I don't have a really nice car. I have a Honda Accord Um, that's paid off, but I have a Honda Accord. And this guy shows up in like a, a, like a, 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 wasn't a white station wagon, but it was a white car that was far worse than mine. And this is an owner of a bank. Yeah. So, I mean, I can assure you, you're spot on. The people who have the most wealth many times don't show it. It's the inverse as well. So two quick comments. One is I work with a billionaire every day. And, and one of the things, one of the things he said the other day, it's really funny uh, is, uh, and I've told the story many times of, I, I love the watch I bought, but I'm super frugal. And I bought a Rolex when a very important thing happened in my life. And it was a, it's a crazy amount of money. I would never do that. I'd never had a watch over a hundred dollars in my life. And, uh, and I was telling Gary the story and he goes, well, you know where I buy my Rolexes. Hey guys, for those of you that are local to St. Louis, I wanted to make sure you knew about an amazing resource that we have uh, to help do some extra deals. Uh, you can email our team at deals at three doors.com. And just so you know, we do deals with other investors all the time. Like it's been hundreds and hundreds over the years and we've averaged over a hundred deals with other investors per year uh, for over the last five years. Uh, We can straight up buy the deal if you're looking for, if you have a wholesale under contract that you want to sell, if you need funding uh, to, to finance a flip or like you're doing a burst strategy, we have funding available for you. If uh, you're trying to wholesale a deal, we're doing JV wholesale deals with, uh, with other wholesalers that quite frankly, some of the deals we're putting together, um, for a beginner or an intermediate investor, uh, they'd probably be walking away from uh, because we have systems and processes and we have buyers in place that are paying top dollar for these properties. So um, make sure you use this resource and the best way to get a, uh, and the only, and the easiest way is to uh, just send us an email, deals at three doors.com. All right, back to the episode. And I bought a Rolex when a very important thing happened in my life. And it was a, it's a crazy amount of money. I would never do that. I'd never had a watch over a hundred dollars in my life. And, uh, and I was telling Gary the story and he goes, well, you know where I buy my Rolexes? I said, where's that? And he said, the Apple store. And he held up his Apple watch. Like this is, this is someone who can buy a lot of Rolexes who, who just doesn't value that. And part of the reason he's where he is, is because he didn't make those decisions. Right. So I love that. So the opposite is true too. And this is what gets us in trouble is you pull up to a stoplight in Chesterfield, Missouri, as I did for five years of my life. And to the right of me is a new BMW and to the left of me is a new Mercedes and behind me is a brand new Tesla. And you're like, man, everybody here is a gazillionaire until you start studying the studies, which show you they're all up to their eyeballs in debt. And here's the, uh, this is, this is one of the most disturbing things I've seen in the last year since I've been in, in this role. I have uh, 370 employees. I have a $57 million salary budget, right? 
And when negotiating either raises or hiring someone or whatever the case is, oftentimes we'll get into conversations that go like this. I have to have X amount of money just to pay my bills. And the latest one, if I told you that the, the offer was substantial, the offer is in the high $300,000 a year range. And it wasn't enough because the person couldn't pay their bills. When you dig in a little bit, so they took a job somewhere else. When you dig in a little bit, you know, they've got the high end house at the high end country club with the high end cars, with the high end student loans, with the high end, right? And if you think that living on $370,000 is hard, um, you know, you got some other challenges. Was that too judgy? I didn't mean to make that judgy. That was judgy, but that's yeah. <laughs> well, I, I struggled with it. You can't make you can't make it on you know thirty grand a month. That, I don't know. Well, well uh, so I don't know if it is judgy. I think we got to check ourselves. Like I, I I believe that you are being candid there and and saying that hey, you know we don't we live in a country of excess, right? Yeah. That's what we live in, and we don't need that much. Yeah. No, you can live off $5,000 a month. Yeah. Even in today's society with inflation going crazy, you could live off of well, that if you had to. You could well, live look, off I, less. Well, I have. If you have four kids like I do. Well, that's a good point. Well, that's a good point. But, but oftentimes this conversation gets turned into Mark doesn't want me to buy anything. And it's crazy how many people will call or write and say, thinking about buying a car, would you approve that? I'm like, I don't have anything to do with approving it. But they want to know, am I making a good decision or not? I love nice things. I want nice things. But I, what I want for all of us is I want you to build your passive income so high that you never have to work again if you don't want to. And then you build your lifestyle based on your income. This is this is math 101. If I was coaching anyone, nephew or someone coming up, whatever, I would say your, your income is going to dictate your lifestyle. And the, the higher percentage of your income each month that you can invest, the wealthier you're going to be. So if, if you make $5,000 a month, can you live on 2,500 a month until you've built your passive income such that you raise, right? You raise your, your, your level of living to match half of your new income. So if I could show you how to build 5,000, 10,000, a hundred thousand dollars a month of passive income, I love the idea of you spending 50 grand a month and having an amazing lifestyle. I have no judgment about how much you spend as long as it's half of your income. So it's a different problem. The different problem is we got to work on our income. Is so once you kind of realize that expenses all, it's crazy. But there are you just study any of the athletes. Uh, what happens to athletes after they stop playing? There's a ninety percent uh, recidivism rate in terms of falling back into poverty for people who are paid millions and millions of dollars. That is that's not a coincidence. And if you think it won't happen to us, it absolutely can. And it's because we live well below well beyond our means. Something's going to happen in your life. It's going to be a financial challenge for you. If you're me, it was the the Great Recession and a couple other bad decisions all mashed into one. But you know, it could be I had a I had an illness in the family that I I was the only one in the family who could pay for this family member to have surgery, and I wasn't going to let her not have surgery. So you know, that's a, that's a fifty thousand dollar hickey. And if you don't have, if you're not wise with your money, you, you ha- you're forced to make really bad choices or heartbreaking choices. And I don't want that for anyone. So you just touched on it a little bit, and I know we're getting a little short on time. We've talked a lot about the finances. Uh, part of this is the mindset as well, which we touched on, but let's touch on one more thing on the mindset. How has your mindset changed from you know when you had 6 million in debt and you were making good money, but you still had a lot of debt and then you lost it all and now you're financially free? What has that allowed you to do and how has it allowed you to grow? Yeah, I think this is a great topic. And so I'm going to, and I'm sorry for the long answer coming. Uh, oh, no, that's what I wanted. I, I want to take over you, the 30 minutes that you told us. I love it. Well, I want to take you back. Um, there was a, there was a time in my life where I grew up very, very poor. And for those of you who don't know me or don't know my story, like so poor that I lived in a car for a short period of time. And so uh, I have never valued money. I've never understood it. You know, growing up, I didn't know. I thought I was either going to sell drugs or be a professional athlete. And that's how I was going to get out of my neighborhood. And lucky for me, I made good grades and I got a scholarship and I was able to go to college on an athletic scholarship, et cetera, and work my way through college and not have any student loans. It's the only way I made it through. But when I looked up at life, I was chasing all the wrong things. 
And I thought my, my job was to go be successful and make a bunch of money and go get rich and do all these things. And it's weird and, and not intuitive, but the harder I tried to go get rich, the harder it was to get rich. And I know it sounds strange, but here's what I mean by that. I was valuing all the wrong things. I, I was thinking, how can I, how can I make a million dollars so I can spend a million dollars, which is the opposite of how wealthy people think. When you think about people who are broke versus people who are wealthy, and this is always a litmus test I give myself. And I, I make it a number that's that, that that maybe has never happened before. So for me, that number would be if I got a bonus this year, if Gary's watching, if I got a bonus this year for a million dollars, what would I do immediately? So make make the do this, do this with me. And, and let's make it something that, that that is more likely for us to do in the masses. Let's say the bonus was let's say you had a, a family member pass away and leave you ten thousand dollars, you didn't know them. Where does your mind go first? $10,000 hits your bank today. What are you doing with the money? And if you think through that, this is going to inform you of where your mindset is. Here's how consumers think. We think consume. Like, oh my gosh, I get $10,000. I can go upgrade my car. Oh my gosh, we're going to go on that vacation we, we couldn't go through in COVID, right? And if I have any money left over for my consumerism and my spending, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to give, ironically. And then after, if I have any money left over after I give, then I'm going to invest money. And if I have any money after I invest, then I'm going to save some money. Well, as we know, the reason, that, and I'm going to argue the reason that we're broke is that we think this way. And I've lived this and had to train myself to get out of this. And I'll tell you that, that how that trigger happened in my life. Today, if I had a million dollars show up or 10,000 show up or whatever the case was, the very first thing I'm thinking is invest. Because what I know is I can change the world with my investment portfolio. Getting an upgraded car does nothing to change the world. I can't help my family with an upgraded car. But if I invest cor correctly, then I can leave a legacy that, that takes care of the people I love for forever. So I'm thinking invest first. Second, I'm thinking save. Why? Because in this market, I don't know what's going to happen. And we never do. And you always want to have enough cash on the sidelines. Third, I'm going to give. And here's what's funny, like in a distant, distant fourth, I don't even think about buying things because I, my wife and I are on, on a on a budget and we rarely vary from it. I just, I don't, I'm not that fancy. I don't need that many things, but that was a, that was a 180 pivot, Ryan, from the, how I lived the first half of my life. So I'll, I'll give you the short story. I, I go to corporate America. That wasn't an awesome fit for me. I become an investor. That was an awesome fit. I become a real estate agent. I start to build all these businesses. I start to make a lot of money. Like I remember the first year I went over 200,000 and 300,000, et cetera. And like, oh my gosh, I'm rich, I'm rich. But what's funny is I made 200 and spent 250. And, and you're never gonna turn that off. Your income is only gonna always go up, right? So that this was the, the trap I fell into. And if you're, never, if you're never content with what you have, you never will be. So in 2005, my, my first wife and I had a tragedy. We, we really struggled to have children. We, have, we had 10 miscarriages and, and we finally um, had, had a child go full term and lived seven days and passed away. Her, her name was Macy Ann Marie. And, uh, and so as you can imagine, it's, it's the worst thing that's ever happened in my life. It's gut wrenching. It's, uh, it happened October, 2005. I'm in the midst of flying high and making all this money and, and have all this debt and I'm buying real estate, doing all this stuff. And part of the reason, this is another really important point. If you follow the story earlier, one year later, I'm borrowing every dollar someone will give me and just pouring it into real estate into 2006 and, and early 2007. And so I, I kind of lost touch with my own value and, and my own value proposition. But here's, here's why that matters. After about a year, and I would say I was in a fog for a year, and I would never make a big financial decision like I did for at least a year. But man, I was making all kinds of bad decisions in that year because you make emotional decisions. And they're, they turned out for me, it wasn't good. Um, so it took about a year to get out of that fog and to try and understand. And, and you know, it's just, it's gut wrenching. And, and, and I'm sorry for having to bring the call, whole call down. But it changed my life. And the reason it did is I was driving, I just took off, we, we jumped in the truck. By the way, I used F-150 and we started driving to Colorado and we got to, to Estes Park, Colorado, and I was flipping through the stations and you can imagine you're cried out, man. You are emotionally exhausted. You, you're, you're begging God to take you instead of your child. Like it's, it's as bad as it gets for, for a father. And I, I overhear this psychologist sharing the third, a third, a third principle. And it goes like this. 
a third of the people that are in your life, this is a third of the people in your sphere of influence are going to love you no matter what you do. I can't imagine a day where I don't absolutely love Jim and Ryan and we connect and I value them and there's, there's nothing they can do to me that I'm going to love them any less. There's, you know, there's, there's a third of the people in your life who will never love you no matter what you do. This is, the, this is from the psychologist, right? And a third of the people just don't register. You can come and go. Now, other people ex- explain this 20%, 20%, 60%, but, but you get the idea. Here's the challenge. This is where keeping up with the Joneses comes from. We spend most of our time and effort. I spent the first half of my life trying to impress people who were, I was never going to be good enough to be around. So I went out, I had to buy the nice things. I had to show off the nice cars and I had to overspend to try and impress people who absolutely wanted to see me fail and, and loved it when they saw me almost go bankrupt. Right. So during this, this year, I had this kind of spiritual awakening and that was, I'm not going to spend one more ounce of my life with that group of people. In fact, I'm going to do everything I can to get out of relationship with that group. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour all my time. And if, you, if you're listening to this, you can't see it. Sorry about that. I'm going to get out of relationship with the third that's never going to love me no matter what. And I don't care what you think about me. When you go through something like that, that powerful, it's liberating. It, you know, if there's any silver lining, I made, I made the decision that day. No one's ever going to treat me poorly and I'm not going to treat anybody poorly. And of course we're human and it happens, but I'm not going to spend one ounce of breath on the third. that's not going to love me no matter what, but I'm going to pour everything I have into the third. that's going to love me no matter what. So if you watch my trends after that, I took on, you know, part of climbing out of bankruptcy was I took on all my grandparents bills, right? I, I built them a house. I, I bought my grandpa a car because no, nothing they were doing was safe. I ended up building my, I retired my mother. I bought her some land. She'd always wanted land. She'd always worked three jobs, you know, her whole life. But I started pouring into the third of people that love me no matter what. And the reward for that has nothing to do with financial. The reward for that is what that does to your soul. So today I can I can tell you that I, I work here not for the money, not for the opportunity. I work here because everyone around me is in the third going to love me no matter what. And it is an awesome feeling to come to work every day. I don't need to work. Um, I, I did what you taught me and I, I built my passive income way above my bills. But I love what I do and I choose to get up and go to work every day. And by the way, the other game here is to take the third that you don't register with and draw them into the third that are going to love you no matter what. And so I tell you all that that long answered story to say the biggest flip in my mindset was when I stopped worrying about impressing people and I instead started living by some very simple guidelines. For me personally, it was get out of debt. Well, who better to do that? I, I studied Dave Ramsey as much as anyone on the planet. I've, I've listened to thousands of hours of radio and podcasts. I've read every book I write. And, and for getting out of debt, there's no one better on the planet. So I, I walked through the baby steps, steps personally and got out of $6 million of debt. If I can do that with Dave Ramsey's plan, any, anybody in a normal situation can do that. But then I started studying David Bach and Robert Kiyosaki and Dr. Thomas Stanley and and, and so many others on this idea of building wealth that I now will absolutely not go above 50% of my income. And to be super brutally transparent, I live on about 10% of my income today. The rest is invested. The rest is going to bless other families. The rest is going to charity, all those things. But that it, it took me, it took me hitting rock bottom emotionally and, you know, to, to kind of wake up to my own value code. Right. And I, I grew up so poor with such loving family members on my mom's side. And I woke up as an adult in my, in my 20s and I didn't have great relationships with a lot of people. They were more impressed with the things that I had or the money that I made than the human that I was. And I just felt myself get further away from my faith and further away from a lot of things. So for me, it took hitting rock bottom to learn that lesson. I hope it doesn't take anyone else going through that to do that. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we do this every, every Friday. We depress everyone on that call. Too, <laughs> if you want to come. Yeah. So, so Mark has a, a group call on Facebook, uh, wealth building, uh, 2.0. If anybody wants to check that out, just search yeah. for, uh, that on Facebook. And, uh, do you have time? One last quick little question. Sure. Yes, sir. Um, so I had the opportunity when Mark was elected president, uh, uh, there was a dinner for all the agents uh, kind of in our office and he kind of announced it to everybody. 
And you made a comment that really stuck with me uh, that you, you know, you were so thankful for all the agents because like, because it was everything that the agents did that helped you become who you were and helped you yep. grow into the leader that you were or that you are um, and develop it. So like looking back at your career, um, what do you think, like, if you had to just give yourself a piece of advice, like yeah. when you're just starting out, that was just a simple, p- actionable piece of advice. What, what would be the most important thing that you could tell yourself? Yeah, there's so, man, this is so good. There are so many uh, things. I would, I would give you a couple. One is, and there's an Arthur Ashe quote, I'm going to get it wrong, but we can look it up. But it's something like, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Something to that effect. And that's what all of us have to realize. We are all in different spots today. We tend to listen to the flashy person who's already made their wealth. And we tend to try and get to where they are immediately. It's not going to happen. This is a 48-year journey you're listening to right now. Um, others of us, uh, will compare our outsides to other people's or our insides against other people's outsides. And that's a dangerous game to play. But let me give you a couple of thoughts. One is grow where you're planted, whatever, whatever you're doing today, be the best you can be at it. And, and that will be more rewarding financially and give you more opportunities. But second is understand that none of us succeed alone. It takes a lot of people. You referenced this. Um, you know, I had been in, I've been in, 20 years of different roles, including being an agent, but the Chesterfield experience I will, that will always be so special to me because 400 people over the course of five years, we started, we had less than hundred and 400 people believed in me enough as the leader and, and our other agents enough and our, and our, and Rebecca Rose, my partner and, and so many others, but, but you believed in me enough and knew that I, all I wanted for you is to have an amazing big life. And together, all we did was go break records in, in all of Keller Williams. Well, that tends to get you noticed around here. And so, you know, I, I quickly moved into a regional role and, and had some other opportunities because of it. But I would argue that without, without that Chesterfield experience, which, by the way, this is another quick point. By the time I was offered to move, it was my seventh move in seven years. So I had, I've had to have some personal family challenges and pain, not as much as I just described, but Sometimes you have to do things that, that other people aren't willing to do. There's very little traffic in the extra mile. So I took the opportunity to do that. But before I took that opportunity, I, had, I was already leading MAPS coaching uh, on the leadership side. I was already operating several other franchises. I was already making you know, three, four $400,000 a year. I didn't need to go take on a office management job in St. Louis. However, it happened to be working for the CEO of Keller Williams at the time. And so I said to myself, if I can go learn this craft from the best in the business and I can be, I can be the best, then I can do anything in this company. I can do anything in this industry. And I I didn't set out to be the president of the largest real estate company on the planet. Um, And without a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of help, I wouldn't, wouldn't be here. Right. So, but I, but I will credit that Chesterfield experience because what it forced me to do, it forced me to get really boring to have the same day over and over again. It forced me to really lean in and care about the people I worked with at at, at a level I never had before, quite frankly. It made me put others first. If enough other people get what they want, you get what you want, Zig Ziglar. And those 400 people, we now have 50 people in that office who are financially free. And and that that is such a, that's, that's the whole mission statement behind our wealth building and that sort of thing. It's, it's, I wanna take as many families as I can passive and, and so in that office, that's been the best playground we've had. It was the longest stay I had in any one market center, et cetera. But, but that's, I would say that I would say the other thing is I stick so many people give up on opportunities or performance or whatever the case is right before it gets really good. I was talking to an investor who in Austin, Texas, imagine being in Austin, Texas, 20 years ago and buying, I think he has 13 doors, it's 13 doors. They were average like 150 grand at, per door. Your, your typical rental in Austin, Texas. Today, the average value is 770. It's 20 years ago. But what he told me was when the market started to creep up and he had doubled in value, he was at the 300 mark, which was only three years ago. He said, I was so tempted to sell all of them and cash out and you know it's several million dollars and all those things. But then I, I asked myself, well, what would I do with the money? I'd just go buy more real estate, which would cost me the same I'm selling for. So he decided to hold on to them and now they've doubled again. So whatever you do, stick with it. The biggest mistakes that I made in this business were uh, 
were things I didn't stick with. And some of the best deals I did in this business were deals I didn't do. So I, I'd have so much coaching for me. I think the, the other one would be hug your loved ones every day. Um, don't drink too much. Don't have bad habits. Um, you know, there's always someone out there willing to help you. It may be up to you to ask for help, um, but stick with it. Grow where you're planted. No matter who you are, everyone listening to this can do anything you choose to do. And there are people around who will help you. That would be my advice. So for those of you who haven't had the opportunity, Mark is this way all the time. I'm, <laughs> I'm just I'm just happy I can listen to you because you make me happy. Uh, I miss you. Stuff, the stuff he's saying, it, there's no BS in this, guys. I mean, we've had enough opportunity to talk to him. This is him. So you talked about Gary. I want to give you kudos. You were the same person at every meeting that I've ever been at, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two -on -two or whether it's to a big, massive group. And that is just, this is the person you are, which is kind of what I was, I was hoping. And you expressed earlier with that question of like, you are now just a giving person. Everyone yeah. that works closely with you says the same thing. So we're just, I'm honored to have been able to talk to you today. Well, you're so kind and it's not deserved, but I appreciate you very much. And uh, I feel the same way. And it, I think you owe me a beer still. I think I, I'm holding like a four-year grudge. I think I, I can't remember if you owe it to me or Jim owes me. I don't I'll I'll, I'll buy. Well, uh, I mean, when are you in St. Louis next? Oh, speaking, I, I can't wait to come see. Yeah. Speaking of when you're in St. Louis next, since we did just listen to your uh, your last one on Friday, I I actually never knew about your your affinity towards golf. So let's do it. I love that. I mean, and, and here's what's cool. Some of you might not know is both of you have been on my wealth building calls and both of you have guest hosted and done all those things. So I appreciate all of, I appreciate everything you do and we don't pay people to do that. So you did it out of the goodness of your heart. Heck yeah. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right. That's a wrap guys. Hope you got as much out of it as I know I did. Thanks again to Mark for uh, his time. Really appreciate you, ma'am. So for additional resources, go to doors to deals.com slash zero 84. We also have a Facebook group. If you just search for doors to deals, you can kind of uh, find us that way as well. So go out, live your purpose and above all else, go after your dreams till next time. Thanks for tuning into the show. For more episodes and resources that will unlock Doors to Deals, check out our website, doorstodeals.com.